everybody. God bless you for joining us tonight. We're going to have a wonderful time in the Word of the Lord, talking about the Tree of Life. And I've got a candlestick here. Seven branches shaped like almond branches of a tree. And I'm going to be delving into that tonight concerning the can uh, candlestick being the Tree of Life in foreshadowing form. And of course, life is given and received through the word, the word of God. Jesus said, my words are life, they're spirit. And we're so thankful tonight that we can have the word of God give us the light. I see the light, I saw the light. And light represents truth. And it's like the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil was lies, where the fruit of life is truth. And so it's very important we understand that there is a connection between the tree of life and the candlesticks. And his word is a lamp that shines to our feet so that we could walk the pathway. And the Bible talks about the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. And the number seven represents perfect. So you've got a lamp giving perfect number seven light for our pathway. And it shines more and more till it brings us to that perfect day, the brightest time of the day. If we're children of the day and not of the night, like 1 Thessalonians 5 talks about, then perfect light, the perfect day, the complete day, would be the best state of being we could be in as believers, where we've got all the light, perfect, mature, number seven, representative of, of maturity and light. And so let's believe God tonight together in Jesus' name that we learn these wonderful truths as we continuing to study the mysteries of the tree of life revealed. We're in part eight tonight. Eight, by the way, is the number of resurrection. And I'm going to be talking about resurrection tonight. Praise God. Let's go right now to the Bible. And I want to mention, first of all, we left off last time talking about Jesus' challenge to people to taste and see that the Lord is good. And how that he said, if any man wants to know if my doctrine's true or not, let him do what I say and then see for yourself. You couldn't be more fair. It's like Romans chapter 12, prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Try it. Taste and see. Do what the Word says. And I was just sharing that with somebody I work with today, that we have to be able to try this before we really have any right to talk about this wonderful way of life. Praise God. So, in other words, do His will. Don't just talk about it. Don't just look at it and form an opinion that has no experience. I once preached a message entitled, Experts with No Experience. And it's so important to experience, or else it's not ours. You, you can't even comment on it. And thinking about this, the tree of life, I want to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I go there often. Chapter 3, verse 18 is just such a blessing to me every time I read it. Because it mentions, but we all, in other words, all of us, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. And when it says open face, it's talking about the face of Jesus. Because it's comparing him with Moses, who represents the old covenant, who put a veil over his face. And it was a message that the children of Israel couldn't, didn't know the destination that their old covenant was taking them to. In other words, the glory was veiled. They, they couldn't see to the end. Or when it talks about the end, it means the destination. No wonder a lot of Jewish people that really don't seek after God, nothing to do with uh, ethnicity, nothing to do with race, uh, in fact, Jews aren't even a race. They'll tell you that themselves. But it's the old covenant lifestyle. 
that system, it's veiling glory and you can't really see the end. So compared to Moses of the old covenant who put a veil over his face, we've got Jesus with open face. And when we look at his open face unveiled, we're beholding as in a glass or King James Version for mirror, the glory of the Lord. And here's why it's a mirror. Remember mirrors, when you look at a mirror, you're seeing yourself. Well, this is an interesting, wonderful mirror because you're seeing what you're going to be turned into as you see it. You're changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So when we receive light, we're changed into the same image. That's why tonight, for example, when we get into the Word of God and, and you're seeing truth, you're seeing revelation, mysteries, this is kind of in our title, Mysteries of the Tree of Life. When a mystery is a mystery, it's a truth that's veiled. But when it's unveiled, and that's the root word of reveal, when it's revealed, you get a revelation when something's revealed. It's not, the word veil is the root word of reveal and unveil. And when it's unveiled, the veil's removed. Praise God. Truth is understood. And so you're seeing glory and it changes you. When you get a real revelation from God, it will change you spiritually. Praise God. It's not just, well, that's an interesting thought. I never thought of that before. That's not revelation. Revelation is, bam, you, you get a truth. It impacts your spirit. You can feel the difference than just listening to an interesting thought. It's a revelation of truth. You've just received light. And according to Paul, it changes you into the very same image that you're looking at. And if that's the open face of Jesus, the unfailed face of Jesus that we're looking at, and we're changed into that image, we become more like Jesus. Truth shines on us. You see, Jesus, don't just think of him as, as a fruit on the tree of life. Remember we talked about how God, you can't receive all of God, just like Adam couldn't receive the whole tree of life. So there was fruit hanging on the branches of the tree of life that in, the, in that fruit was the essence of the whole tree. Well, in Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you can receive Jesus. He even said, eat my flesh and drink my blood. Spiritually representing, believing his words and getting that into you. So Jesus isn't only the fruit of life on the tree of life. And he's not only the seed that's planted in the soil of our hearts, according to the parable of Jesus the sower and the seed, the seed is the word, the soil is our hearts. But it produces a tree like him from a seed. The seed brings forth a tree like the fruit from which it came from. But he's also light. So you see him as the fruit of life, literally hanging on the tree, the cross, like fruit hangs on the branches. But he's also light that shines on us. So let's put those two pictures together, fruit from a tree and light that shines on us and changes us into the same image. See, stop and think about it. The seed plants in the soil of your heart and it brings forth just like the tree from which it came. The light of Jesus shines from his open unveiled face and it changes you into the same image like him. Can you see the same thing? The tree's being reproduced from the seed from which it came. The image of Jesus is being reproduced in you. So light and fruit with the seed of life, both are connected. And that's why I see such wonderful, powerful imagery in the candlesticks. Because you've got the light, the seven golden candlesticks, seven branches, and they're shaped like branches of an almond tree. Now let's go to that part in the Bible where it actually says that. In uh, the book of Exodus, and let's go to chapter, I believe it's chapter 25. Praise God. Wonderful, wonderful truths. Uh, let me see. 
actually, I'm going, I'm going to go ahead to a chapter, I guess it's 37. Let me see. It's in chapter 25, but I want to look at it here in chapter 37. He made the candlestick of pure gold. The instructions were given in chapter 25, but the actual uh, constructing of them is right here. The construction. The candlestick was of pure gold and it was of beaten work. And that's how he made the candlestick. His shaft, there you've got the middle shaft, and his branches, his bowls, knops, and flowers were of the same. So there's three branches out of the one side, three branches out of the other. Six branches going out of the sides thereof. And there it is, three branches of the candlestick of the one side thereof, three branches of the candlestick out of the other side thereof. Three bowls made after the fashion of almonds in one branch. So you got one branch, six all together with the shaft. One branch had three almonds. And then it also had a knop and a flower. And three bowls make like unto almonds in another branch, a knop and a flower. So throughout the six branches going out of the candlestick. In the candlestick were four bowls. That's the shaft. There was four. Notice there were three bowls in each branch. And each one of them had a knop and a flower. Well, there was four bowls in the shaft. And each one of them had a knop and a flower. The bowls, he said, look like almonds. So the bowls, when you read about bowls, you might wonder what in the world are they making bowls on a branch-shaped candlestick for? Well, bowls represent the almonds, the fruit. And the knop would be the bud. The flower would obviously be the flower. So you've got all three stages of growth on the candlestick at the same time. Some of you have heard me teach some of this before. You've got the bud, which is the first stage, and it leads to the flower, the second stage. And then, of course, pollination and all of that occurs. And then you've got the fruit, the almond. So the bud, the flower, and the fruit. And by the way, I think I mentioned this before. I might still have this on my system so I could show you that. Well, there you see a picture of the candlestick. Uh, and I also had another picture showing the number of books of the Bible were actually shown in the candlestick. And there are all together 66 elements in that candlestick. Each knob, if you look at the top left part of the screen, had a bowl and a flower grouped with it. And each branch had three knobs. Three flowers, three bowls, that's nine. And look over to your right. The shaft had four knobs, four bowls, and four flowers. That's 12. And so if you've got six branches and each of them have nine elements, that's 54 elements. And then you've got the shaft with 12. 54 plus 12 equals 66, the exact number of books of the Bible. That always blesses me when I think about the Bible. Amen. So a seven-branch candlestick is shaped like an almond tree in the Bible. There you got the idea of fruit and light, just like Jesus. He is like the fruit of life on the branches hanging on the tree, the cross. Taste and see that the Lord is good. You, and it's so wonderful because it, it is, when he talked about uh, tasting, drinking his blood and eating his flesh in John chapter 6, that represents, that is represented by the bread and the wine at the Last Supper, Communion Supper. He said the bread represents his body, the wine represents his blood. And Jesus was talking about pouring out the wine as if he was shedding his blood and, and breaking the bread as if his body was dying, talking about the cross. This was called the Last Supper because it's the last time they feasted together before he would go to the cross. So he was foreshadowing that. And because he was going to go to the cross, that cross would be the central focus thing of everything, the center of the universe, you could say. Because that made the difference between heaven and hell 
for us that are saved and know Jesus Christ. That work of the cross, his suffering, his death, because that's where we were baptized into at that point of his existence, his death. Everything starts at that cross, at his death. And Paul said, if I'm going to glory, I'm glorying in the cross. And that was the place where we were united to him in his death, as his death counted as our deaths, taking care of our death penalties so that we don't have to go to a devil's hell. And we could have our sins remitted, which were the cause of us going to a devil's hell. He takes our sins away because we're, we were supposed to die because of our sins. And his death counts as ours. Our deaths are taken care of. And then the burial and the resurrection and the burial, there's that burial. It's like there's that seed. It's being planted into the ground. And remember that his tomb was in a garden where the cross was? There was a garden nearby the cross. And that's where he was buried like a seed. Amen. And we were buried with him by baptism into death. And then he resurrected and came out. And then 40 days later, he ascended up into heaven and sat on that throne. And he's been king there for the last 2,000 years. But the whole picture of us getting baptized into that death, at the place of that death, that is why he talked about there, that point of my life. It's interesting. That's why I like to say existence, because he would die. That point of his existence as death is where he stressed, this is the bread, this is the wine, this is what you've got to eat, this is what you've got to drink. It's the truth of the cross, the truth, the truth, the truth of the cross. Get that in you. Without me dying, it's just like a doorway that doesn't have the blood of the lamb around it that Hebrews wouldn't go in through and be saved from any death. It had to have the blood on it. He said, I'm the door, but he had to have that blood. That represents... He's the way, he's the truth, and he's the life. But there had to be that death. Because like a doorway, through his death, we come to salvation. Hallelujah. And there we get the truth that all of our eternal life focuses on, that death of the cross. And so here you've got talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood all focused on that death death, representing believe the truth about the cross, and you're devouring that bread, so to speak, and you're drinking that wine. Amen. And that's your food of eternal life. Remember the fruit on the tree of life would have rendered Adam, who was a sinner after he sinned, obviously, and God spoke about him going to that tree of life and eating and living forever. So God had to get him out of there because he had to have his sin dealt with if he was going to eat of that fruit of life and live forever. Otherwise, if his sin wasn't taken care of and he would eat that fruit and physically live forever, there'd be another devil in the universe, another sinner that doesn't die. And so Jesus Christ had to die for us, and God had to get Adam away from that tree. That's why he separated him. But now that Jesus has come and gone to the cross, now we can go to the fruit of life. We, we see our sins remitted. Oh, I need to show you this. Some, so much is opening up right now in my spirit about this, and some of you have probably already caught this before, but it's just coming to me so strong. I feel the Lord prodding me to get back to this. Now notice, in Genesis 3 and 22, after man sins, God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever, therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden. So God had to get him out of there. Now, God wanted him to eat the fruit of, the, of life before, and it would render him immortal. It would render him immortal. You know, somebody who had that life of God inside of himself. But all of a sudden now, God doesn't want him to take it because he's got the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil in him. And God doesn't want that combination because Adam had to have his sins dealt with before he could take of the tree of life now. God does not want us mixing sin with righteousness. He does not want us sitting on the fence and one hand in the world and the other hands holding on to Jesus. 
you know, like two-timing God. <laughs> we're, we're flirting with the world. And the church is called the bride. And Jesus is like the husband or the groom. And his bride making a play with the world and serving him. He doesn't tolerate that. You've got to be in all the way. You can't sit on the fence. You can't have heaven and Hollywood or heaven and hell, whatever you want, at the same time. You've got to serve Jesus. Praise God. All, and in this case, because Adam still had sin in him, God said, I don't want him to mingle that with a fruit of life. His sin has to be dealt with first. I need to maintain his mortality because I'm going to save him from his sin by having me in the flesh die for him to take care of his sin. And then he can live forever. And so I believe that's why Jesus talked about eating bread and drinking the blood, the wine, talking about the cross and the death, because the food of life happens at the tree of life, the cross. Hallelujah. So much is there just about that uh, tree. And so, like I said, he's, he's like fruit hanging from branches on the tree of life and light. And the candlestick shows both of it at the same time. You see, it not only shows the three stages of life at the same time, the bud, the flower, and the fruit, but it also shows the idea of a tree bearing fruit plus lights because it's a candlestick at the same time. You know, we talk so much about the Ark of the Covenant in the past, and there's so much also about the candlestick and really all the pieces of furniture in the temple and the tabernacle. It would blow our minds if we looked and saw all the truth opened up to us. Wonderful, wonderful truth. So in Zechariah's prophecy, when you go to Zechariah chapter 4, look at how things open up there. Chapter 4, and let's look at the first couple verses. The angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep and said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked and behold a candlestick all of gold with a bowl on the top of it and his seven lamps thereon and seven pipes to the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof. So picture this, the candlestick and he sees the seven candles and above the candlestick was a bowl and that from that bowl was coming a pipe for each of the candles, seven pipes. So the bowl was filled with something that was feeding these seven lamps on the candlestick. That's what you're seeing when you read Zechariah chapter 4. Now there's more, but at this part of the vision, I want to explain something. The seven lamps, like I said, were in the form of an almond tree. If there were almonds that the knops, or rather the bowls, remember the bowls were the fruit, the bowls, if the bowls were almonds, then you know it's almond branches. And so it's like an almond tree. The candlestick was shaped like an almond tree. Why an almond tree? I believe the Bible has the answer. The tree had lights or lamps, seven of them. And in the same chapter of Zechariah 4, where it talks about him seeing this vision of this candlestick, we read these words in verse 10. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice. There's a certain they that he's talking about. I'll tell you what they are in a moment. And shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. Those seven. Now, what's interesting is uh, Zechariah was a prophet, and in his day, they were rebuilding the temple that was destroyed by the Babylonians. Solomon built the first temple. In Zechariah's day, two men teamed up. Joshua the high priest... Not the same Joshua with Joshua and Moses that you think about. This is a completely different Joshua centuries later. Joshua was a, another man who was a high priest. And Zerubbabel was the governor. So you've got a, a, a spiritual leader and you've got a governmental secular leader. 
working together, a high priest and a governor. And they were rebuilding the temple. So Zerubbabel, it said, had the plummet, the plumb line. The plumb line was in the hand of Zerubbabel, the governor. And it says that those seven, they are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro throughout the whole earth. Now, isn't it interesting? You're seeing a link of the seven candlesticks, with our, which are seven lights, linked to the seven eyes of the Lord looking through the whole earth. All the earth, seven always represents all or completeness. So if you've got seven eyes, then they're looking at all, the whole earth, in other words. And they're repeated and they pop up again and again in the Bible. When you go to Revelation chapter 5, you see, I believe it's the sixth verse, John saw a vision of a lamb as it had been slain having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Notice the terminology. These eyes are the spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And what did we just read in Zechariah? In verse 10, those seven are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro throughout the whole earth. Now, it's said in Revelation that they're the seven spirits of God that go through the whole earth. But there are seven eyes on the Lamb, and it's like Zechariah has it all jumped up into one picture, seven eyes that run to and fro throughout the whole earth. Isn't it wonderful how the Bible fits together like that? Now, we just discovered that the seven eyes were also associated with the seven-lamped candlestick. Because when you go back to Revelation again, let's check that out again. In verse 6, seven eyes are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Let's go back to chapter 4, one chapter earlier. And when John sees, the first thing he sees is a throne, when heaven is opened up to him. Remember the countdown I have on my videos? There's a door open, and it's like a wilderness all around. But behind this door, there's like another world. That's like what Revelation shows a door open in heaven, and he looks and sees heaven. And then there's the throne in there, which the Ark of the Covenant represents. And you see the one on the throne like a sardine stone. And there's a rainbow around like emerald, which is not physical, is not actual green light around his throne. It's life. These are all visions and they're all symbols. And then it says around the throne were four and 20 seats. On the seats were four and 20 elders. And then out of the throne, there was lightnings and thunderings and voices and seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now notice this, the seven lamps, that's the candlestick. Everything here is temple typology and, and temple imagery. Seven lamps are the shape just like that. That's what John saw. And they're called the seven spirits of God. And then when you go to chapter 5, verse 6, the seven eyes on the Lamb are those seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. So right there in Revelation 5 and 6, coupled together with Revelation 4 and 5, you've got the seven spirits of God linked to the candlestick and linked to the seven eyes on the Lamb. All linked together. Hallelujah. Isn't that beautiful? And you know there's messages there when it's connecting together like that. Now, remember the seven spirits of God. I think we talked about this a little earlier in our series, but where you'll notice in my ministry, we take passages that we've already looked at and we uh, look and see even more to do with the same scriptures. And we build on, there's, there's layers and layers and layers of truth in every verse. So let's go to Isaiah 11, which we've discussed partly already. Chapter 11. And remember the tree language? There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. A branch shall grow out of his roots. That's Jesus. David was the son of Jesse. And David was the ancestor of Jesus Christ through Mary. 
Didn't come through Joseph. Remember, it came through Mary because God was the father, not Joseph. And here you've got Jesus's human ancestor, Jesse, as a stem. There's going to be a rod out of the stem of Jesse. There's going to be a branch out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, number one. So the Spirit of the Lord, number one, is mentioned here. That would be the shaft. You start off with the shaft, the Spirit of God himself. And the Spirit of wisdom. And notice they all come in pairs. Wisdom and understanding. Counsel and might. Spirit of knowledge, fear of the Lord. Notice how he says that. Three sets of pairs, just like three sets of pairs. Hallelujah. And what will these seven spirits, there's seven spirits. Remember Revelation said the eyes of the Lord are the seven spirits of God. And remember the seven lamps are also the seven spirits of God. So here you got the seven eyes, the seven lamps all right there. And what will this light, what will these seven spirits, this seven or perfect light do to Jesus? This is a prophecy of Jesus. It says, they shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. Now, quick understanding, quick means living, live. And isn't that powerful? The fruit of life and the light, this light gives you living alive, understanding that's alive. Under, that's revelation. I never thought of this before. God's putting this in my spirit right now. That's the difference between having an interesting thought and getting a revelation. Because when you get quick understanding, that's living understanding. It's alive. That's the best way to describe it right there. It's alive. Now I know how to explain this better to people. It's something that's getting in you and you know it's alive. It's not just a thought. It's not just a theory. It's alive. And Jesus is the living word. And this gives you quick or living understanding in the fear of the Lord. And not only that, he won't judge after the sight of his eyes. You know, you can't judge a book by its cover. Jesus sees a lot of wolves in sheep's clothing. And if you were to judge a book by the cover, you'd think they're sheep. But he doesn't judge a book by the cover. He doesn't judge a wolf by its sheep's clothing. <laughs> he sees in the heart because he's got quick understanding. And he won't reprove after the hearing of his ears. It's not just what people say about Aren't you so glad that it's not just what people say about you that he's going to go by? It's he doesn't judge after the sight of his eyes. He doesn't reprove after the hearing of his ears. So what can you do if you don't go after the sight or after the hearing? But with righteousness, that's what you do. With righteousness, you judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. And there you're going to get... And this isn't, by the way, this is not talking literally, folks. Please, please get this in your spirit. There's people that will literalize visionary emblems. I mean, it's like saying, John saw a lamb with seven eyes and seven horns. I can't wait to get to heaven because I want to see that cute little thing with its seven little eyes and its seven little horns. Yeah, but he's walking around as if he had been dead. <laughs> he's got some wounds there, in other words. Remember the nail prints in Jesus? When we read that, that's not literal. The wolf lying down with the lamb is not literal. The leopard lying down with the kid is not literal. The calf and the young lion and the fatling and a little child shall lead them. Think of this. See, in the Old Testament, remember the unclean food? Couldn't eat pork. That's unclean. Uh, you could eat lamb. You know, about all about the hoof and all of that. And, and you could eat beef, chicken and that, but you can't eat pork. And there's certain unclean creatures compared to clean creatures. Remember when Noah put the animals on the ark? The clean ones didn't go in by twos. They went in by sevens. The unclean animals went in by twos. The reason the clean animals went in by sevens is because they were going to sacrifice some of them and they needed some of them alive to propagate that species. 
but the unclean you don't sacrifice and Israel would not sacrifice an unclean animal any more than they would eat an unclean animal. So here, if you look carefully, the wolf is an unclean animal and it's going to dwell with the lamb, which is a clean animal. Now, in the Old Covenant, Israelites were clean and Gentiles were unclean. Remember the vision of Peter in Acts chapter 10? He sees a sheet come down and it's knit at the four corners by a rope. You can just picture it hanging there. And it, it was loaded with all kinds of unclean animals. And God says to Peter, slay and eat. And I never ate anything unclean and I never will. God says, don't you ever call common or unclean what I have cleansed. And then Peter goes to an unclean Gentile's home. And then he realizes that the house is filled with Gentiles, but God told him to go. And Jews wouldn't fellowship with Gentiles because they were clean and mingling themselves with unclean people. And then it dawns on Peter, now I know of a surety not to call any man common or unclean. He understood the vision. Those unclean animals represented the Gentiles. And God was cleaning them. He was bringing them into the church. And by the time it was over with, they started speaking in tongues as God filled them with the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 10 and 46. And then the Jews that were standing there with Peter were kind of looking at each other. And then they're amazed because Gentiles, unclean Gentiles, got the Holy, Holy, Holy Spirit in them. God had to have cleansed them. And then Peter says, who's going to forbid me from baptizing these in water? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. So if unclean animals represent unclean Gentiles, look at it again. When this Messiah comes, the wolf, the unclean Gentile, is going to dwell with that lamb, the clean Israelite. The leopard, the unclean, will lie down with the kid, the clean, the calf, the clean, will, and the young lion, the unclean, and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. It's talking about people's hearts all being changed, and not just Gentiles and Jews, but also people that got the spirit and rage of a wolf, you know, and, and they're going to dwell with the lamb because God's going to change their hearts. And people that were normally so violent and so bitter and, and, and angered, God's going to change all of their hearts so a little kid's going to be able to lead them all. It's talking spiritually about the results of the ministry of Jesus. It's not saying an actual wolf is going to lie down with an actual lamb. Amen. Get the real picture and you start seeing the wonderful things that God... And it's all because... What's represented on these seven candlesticks, that light is going to give Jesus quick understanding. Now, remember I said that we're changed into his same image? He's not going to judge after the, uh, let me see, sight of his eyes. He's going to judge righteous judgment, not judgment after the sight of your eyes. He's not going to reprove after the hearing of the ears. He's going to judge righteous judgment. Not by what he hears, not by what he sees, but quick and living understanding. The life of God, the revelation of God is going to work. And it's going to, that's what those seven spirits of God are going to cause him to do. That's why they're on the lamb. The seven eyes of the seven spirits of God are on the lamb. They, he's got that quick understanding. And by the way, quick understanding, the Lord's opening this up right now too understanding these seven lamps my lord open this up i never saw this before these seven lamps are going to give him quick understanding now god's showing me right now how to tie together the seven lamps with the seven eyes these seven spirits or the seven lamps shine on him give him jesus quick understanding and look what understanding is represented by in Ephesians chapter 1. Somebody guess it already? The eyes of your understanding. Isn't that powerful? I never made that connection before this moment. They'll give him quick understanding. They'll give him eyes. Seven eyes. And, and he won't judge after his natural eyes. It's talking about the eyes of the Lord, the Spirit of God. 
see your physical eyes are how mostly by which you understand and comprehend the world around you. He's going to have perfect eyes, seven of them, and they shall give him quick understanding, it said in Isaiah. And that's why the Lamb has the seven lamps, which are the seven spirits of God, kind of put into him as seven eyes. Because Isaiah 11 says, those seven spirits of God will give Jesus quick understanding and eyes represent understanding. Are you catching that? Hallelujah. Isn't that powerful? Those seven spirits of God listed in 11 and 2 of Isaiah will give him quick understanding, which are the seven eyes of understanding. Amen, amen. Awesome, awesome. That's why I love getting together with these Bible studies with you folks and sharing this because the Lord is revealing and showing such powerful revelation while we're teaching. That tells us we're, you know what ha what's happening? We are looking at Jesus with an open face. He's unveiled his face to us. He's shone his face. You know how the Bible says, seek the face of God, seek the face of God. Well, when he unveils his glory to you, and he's with open face, you have found the face of the Lord that you're seeking. And when you find it and you see the open face, he shines glory and he changes you. Now, remember again, we're being changed to the same image. Okay, keep that in mind. What we've seen with Jesus, with the seven spirits of God shining on him, and it's all using tree language or branches, stem and all of that, and we're changed to that same image, and he is given quick understanding so that he doesn't judge people by his eyes. He doesn't judge people by his ears. He judges them with righteous judgment. Keep that in mind. Corinthians said that looking into the face of Jesus causes us, in verse 18 of chapter 3, to be changed into that same image. Eating the fruit of life propagates the tree of life in our lives because the seeds in it because the seeds in it eating the fruit of life propagates the tree of life in our lives just like looking at his face sees his light changes into his image now jesus spoke of eating his flesh and drinking his blood john chapter 6 matthew 26 with the last last supper uh, he referred to his sacrifice in that instance because his body was broken like bread and his wine was pour, his blood was poured out like wine. And eating that would cause us to have eternal life. He said it flat out. He said it in John chapter 6. You eat my flesh, you drink my blood, you'll have eternal life. And the point of a lamb with seven eyes, as the candlesticks had seven lamps, all of that speaks of sacrifice. Here's how. See, Jesus is a lamb in Revelation 5 because he was sacrificed. Lambs were sacrificed. And it was for our sins. And priests actually ate part of the sacrifice that they offered. In fact, the lamb whose blood was put on the doorways in Egypt, remember, that lamb's flesh was eaten inside those homes. And it pictures the fruit of life being eaten in the garden. Picture the entrance where the blood was put as the door. Now, what would have happened if Adam, after he was cast out, tried to go back into that garden, and in that garden, at that entrance, there was a sword of fire that turned every way, a flaming sword protecting it. There was the carabim that were at the east of that garden. That would keep, if Adam tried to walk in there, it would kill him. So you've got a death at the entrance. You've got a death at the entrance. Now Jesus, he's going to take our death for us. So can you catch this? If there's a death at the entrance, remember the Hebrews' homes, the entrance had blood, there was a death at the entrance? That all works together with the garden. If Adam tried to go in, there would have been a death. But what was that lamb sacrificed for? And why was its blood put at the entrance of those Hebrew homes if it wasn't a message telling us that, Adam, if you tried to get into that garden, you would die at the entrance. But you know something? I, the Lord Jesus Christ, am going to be sacrificed for you. 
and I'm going to die at the entrance so you can get in. Can you get it? If I take your sin, your sins would have had that sword slay you because no unclean thing is getting in the garden. It's because of your sin that you die at that entrance. But I'm going to take your sins. I'm going to die at the entrance. And so next time you come by, it doesn't see any sin in you because I've taken it and you can go on in. And then when you go on in, you go up to that tree of life and you eat its fruit and live forever because your sins have been taken care of. I'm not going to keep you away from the tree of life anymore because it was your sins that kept you away and your sins are gone. Just like go through that entrance of the bloodstained doorway in Egypt and get in there and eat the flesh of that lamb. Go into that garden and eat the fruit of life. And Jesus is the lamb who said, eat my flesh and you'll have eternal life. You see how it all fits together. Praise God. The idea of a tree of life mingled with the idea of the sacrifice of Jesus is such a powerful revelation. We eat his flesh. We drink his blood and we get eternal life. And I've been quoting it all night and I know you know it's there, but oh, let's just look at it again in John chapter six where he actually talks about all of that and just read. Don't you love it? Reading the way he explained it. He said in verse 27, labor not for the meat which perisheth. They had just seen him multiply bread and fishes and they wanted more. And they worked all that way to go over the Sea of Galilee to go and find him so they could have more bread and fishes. He says, don't make so much effort like that just for food that perishes. But do labor for the meat that endureth unto everlasting life, <laughs> which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. Then said they unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? You, you told us to labor to get a certain kind of meat that gives us eternal life. Jesus answered, this is the work of God. Believe on him whom he hath sent. You want to know the work God wants you to have? You want to know the labor you're supposed to exert? Believe. Not get in boats and go over seas of Galilee and get fish and bread. Believe. That's the work. And remember, that's how they eat as well. Jesus said, "When I, well, look at it. He said, our fathers, they told Jesus, our fathers ate manna and they got it from Moses. He gave them bread from heaven, Moses, and, and he had a sign. What sign do you show that we may see and we may believe you? What dost thou work? Our fathers ate manna in the desert. Moses, he's our old covenant leader. You're this other covenant, but ours, Moses, he had a sign. He had bread following him. And Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. He said, You just had Moses who gave you bread. But when you're telling me you want to see me give a sign like you saw Moses give a sign, and the sign he gave was bread from heaven, let me let you in on something. Moses never gave you that bread. God did. So you're already wrong on one point. And not only that, I am the bread that the Father is giving. So Moses didn't even count in both of those cases. He wasn't the one that gave you bread, and he wasn't even that bread. But he said, My Father gave you the bread from heaven, and the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. And they said, Well, Lord, evermore give us this bread. He said to them, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me. You, you get, get me? You've got your food. You'll never hunger. You believe on me. You'll never thirst. And there's the bread and the wine. You'll never hunger and you'll never thirst. You know, that reminds me so much of those beautiful, beautiful words that Jesus said when he talked about hunger and thirst after righteousness. Hunger and thirst after it. Remember, with righteousness, Jesus is going to judge people, not with the eyes, not with the, but with righteous judgment because he's got that life and we're to hunger after that righteousness and thirst after it. And it all goes back to taking the fruit of life, which is Jesus from the tree and getting it. It all goes back to the light that shines from the candlestick and it changes us into his image. And now he's saying, I am that bread, hunger and thirst. This is the Lord showing me something new. I never saw this either. 
He is our righteousness. So when he says hunger and thirst after righteousness, that's like saying, eat my flesh and drink my blood because right here, I'm righteousness in flesh and blood. I am righteousness in flesh. Hunger and thirst. There's always the bread and the wine. There's always the drinking and the food and the eating. And it all has to do with the cross. My, the Lord has so blessed us tonight with revelation. This is so wonderful. Hallelujah. I'm glad this is recorded. I'm glad it's archived so we can research it and dig into it. And now, as I bring this down tonight and bring this to a close, he said, you've also seen me and you don't believe though. You're not, here you ask me what to do and I've told you believe and you're not doing it. As the Father giveth, all that the Father giveth to me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Because I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me. That all of which he has given me, I should lose nothing. But should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me. That everyone which seeth the Son, and believeth on him. Unlike you guys, you're seeing me, but you're not believing. May have what? Everlasting life. I will raise him up at the last day. The Jews murmured because he said, I'm the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, so forth and so on? He says, don't murmur among yourselves. No man can come to me except the father which has sent me draw him and I will raise him up at the last day. It's written in the prophets. Oh, I can go on and on. But here it is. He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. So you know how you eat the bread? You believe it. You eat the bread by believing Jesus. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness. That's what you guys were talking about a little earlier with Moses. And you didn't even realize Moses didn't give you that bread. God did. But guess what? They ate manna and they're dead. But this is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. See, the man in Moses' day came from heaven. But people, even when they did eat that, although it was from heaven, they died. But Jesus said, I'm the bread come from heaven now. And unlike manna, you eat me and you will get eternal life and never die. I'm the living bread which came down from heaven. And if any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Oh my, so much is coming. Hallelujah. So I'm going to have to hold that thought and have you remember that I'm holding it till we come next time where we are changed into the same image like he is. He had those seven spirits of God come on him. They made him not judge after his eyes, not judge after his ears, but he judged righteously. And we're being changed that same image. Oh, folks, there's so many mysteries of the tree of life that God wants to open up to us like this. And this is just so wonderful. And thanks so much for spending this time with me tonight. And do it. It's time for our offering. And if you'd like to give to our ministry, and this is a blessing to you, you can do so by e-transfer or PayPal at bolm.portage at gmail.com or paypal.me slash breathoflifechurch. We really appreciate your giving and it goes toward the work of this ministry. Thanks and God bless.